We got so many people. That's good. I didn't know. Yeah, no, this is it. Okay, we are going to get started because I think uh, there's a lot to be covered. And quite frankly, as I just indicated to Dr. Bolduc, to Francois, that, um, you know, this is a new area for us coming in. And I am delighted to see so many people really interested. Uh, my name is Dirha Walrieger. And on behalf of the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, we're really pleased to welcome you to this webinar. It is the first one that we've ever done that includes um, artificial intelligence, AI, but it absolutely is application to an area which is obviously dear to all of us. And that is, how do we actually uh, improve diagnosis, both in terms of um, timeliness and in terms of accuracy? Um, I actually am going to just introduce uh, Dr. Bodok, and then I'm going to get out of the way because he will be able to provide you with a much better intro in terms of the uh, in terms of the topic area. He's also set it up to be quite interactive. So I'm going to suggest that if people would like to respond to questions, that there are two ways. You may definitely raise your hand. Um, it may be it may be. Uh, difficult though because there's so many people on for us to be able to actually see everyone's hand so I'm going to play a little bit of a role for um, Francois by um, letting him know kind of whose hands might be up so I'll kind of shepherd a little bit um, but definitely use the chat box as well so if everybody I mean I'm sure we're all used to it by now go into the chat you may respond in there and we'll try as much as possible to try to bring those comments in we had quite frankly, anticipated a much smaller group. So we were thinking <laughs> the interaction would be easy to manage. Obviously, we were underestimated the appeal of this to our rare disease audience. So we will do our best with regard to some of the questions because it really was set up to be much more interactive than it was in terms of just a straightforward presentation. But as I say, I'm going to introduce Dr. Francois Boudouk, who's at, um, in um, Edmonton, Alberta, at the university there. And he will introduce the topic and he will also then, you know, kind of go through the introduction and then we'll hopefully have the opportunity to have some interaction with the audience, which is kind of what he wanted, but also talk about the research project that he's uh, proposing. So, uh, thank you so much, Francois, for being willing to do this. It's been a delightful. I haven't known uh, Dr. Bodo for all that long, but when he came to me and kind of raised the topic of interest, I was like immediately said, yes, this is what we need to do. We need to also be able to bring this to a broader audience. So I'm just thrilled that he was willing to do this. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to uh, uh, Dr. Bodo. Thank you so much, Duran. Um you know, I have to say, I met Duran about a year ago, a little more, and I was amazed. And sometimes in life, you meet some people that you're like, oh, this is a giant. And we're lucky to have a giant like this in Canada, I would say, uh, from what I've seen, because it helps everyone get together uh, and, in, and, and, and kind of, you know, do more than the sum of the parts, as we say. So I'm really, really thrilled. And I agree with Duran when we spoke about this, um, the idea was that maybe we'd get like five, 10 people. And <laughs> um, anyway, maybe it's a good thing. I didn't know there would be so many people. Thank you for not telling me that there was so many people. I've been stressed out. I'm sorry if I'm going to slur. I came back to Edmonton late last night from Ottawa. So I didn't sleep much last night. So I'll try to do my best. Uh, I'm not a computer scientist uh, or an artificial intelligence developer. Uh, so if there are some in the audience here that are uh, specialized in engineering or computer science, I apologize. If I say something wrong, please send me an email. Uh, let me know on the on the chat or in person here. Uh, but but I'm somebody who uh, as a pediatric I'm a pediatric neurologist uh, in I trained in Montreal at McGill and and then I went on to do a PhD in in neurogenetics to understand how we could develop some treatment. Uh, for key symptoms of people with intellectual disability, and I specialize in fragile X syndrome. Uh, now, when I moved to uh, to Edmonton uh, 15 years ago, now uh, the goal was to uh, try to understand better not only fragile X but also other rare condition that leads to intellectual disability, autism, developmental delay. So that's my area of interest. I've uh, I had a chance to go to the to the symposia, to the meeting in uh, in uh, Ottawa in March, I think that was organized by court. And I saw so many people with different disorders, different uh, issues. Uh, and I thought that was really, really interesting that um, 
to some degree there's difference, but there's a lot of overlaps in, in the needs and, and what people are uh, experiencing. So I'm gonna show some slides, but I just wanted to say that our goal is try to talk a little bit about what, what we've been doing, but also like see what you guys think about it. That was the kind of main purpose of this webinar is to see where are people at? And I think just the number of response, it tells me that this is something people are aware of, uh, which I've seen with my own patient and the families and uh, also with the clinician uh, that are using uh, tools themselves. So yeah, so I'll get started. I'm just gonna share the screen if you bear with me here. So I'm gonna do that here. So really the talk or the, it's not really a talk today. It's more like a short, this a sh a couple of slides to set up the stage for people that may not be uh, up to speed with some of the concept and just to kind of have some share knowledge and uh, and then to open it up to see what people think around the table and in terms of like, how can we use AI? Should we use AI? What are the issues if we're using AI? So applying artificial intelligence to accelerate the, the, the disorder diagnosis, of disease, sorry, diagnosis. That's kind of the topic I wanted to touch on today. Now, uh, first I need to thank Drain, as I mentioned, because for putting this together in a, I've never seen a, a webinar put together so fast. So thank you. And uh, I think the number of response talks to the network and the strength of that network. I think that's very, very important going forward. So Doreen shared with me a couple of slides around uh, rare disorders and issues. So I kind of put that together here and I, I want to go over that with you and, and maybe just kind of use that to set up the stage. So there's different steps or failure point, I guess, in some cases where things may not work out for achieving a diagnosis. Now, I just want to say from the get-go that to me, diagnosis is not the final goal of this interventions are an intervention. I think our pharmacological, non-pharmacological, there's a lot of interventions, but the purpose of the short-term project we're working on is really to try to see how can we move the needle in terms of achieving diagnosis more accurately and more quickly. Uh, and who are the potential players in that? So kind of summarized it here with three types of players, the patient, and I would say in my case, families, uh, we could replace that with individual with lived experience, I think, also. Uh, and, and then the health professionals, and I'm kind of inclusive there, like I don't mean just doctors, I mean doctors, nurses, allied health, uh, social worker, and so on. And then the policymaker. And I kind of broke it down like that just to sit, to have like a systematic approach for each of these stages. And this is, like I said, largely inspired from documentation that Doreen shared with me. So one of the things that want to do with uh, AI is, I guess, address a problem I've seen in my clinic, which is probably downstream of that path at the referral level, uh, where people are looking for information, uh, doing a lot of research, but don't necessarily know what to look for and then don't know if they can trust the information. And in rare disorders, because there's not a lot of familiarity in the health professional side of things, there's always kind of a weird dynamic where you're doing research and kind of going to the physician as if you're going to the teacher with your with your kind of thesis and and you're not sure how that's going to be received. And so I've had some families who are actually afraid of showing me. So now I always talk, you know, tell me what you find. We'll discuss it. We'll look at it. Uh, but I think there's like a little a little bit of communication issue there for sure. But if we look at the early stages, the pre recognition before you before you are clear that you've got uh, something, uh, there is issues that are reported as lack of information uh, for patient uh, or ignoring the signs because you're worried you've got something serious. Uh, health professional deal with atypical signs, access to testing. And in terms of policy, I think there will be also access to testing and health awareness. So there's a lot of ways this can go wrong. The next step is detection. So once you have established more clearly some signs or you're experiencing some symptoms, uh, you may not actually uh, feel comfortable about having dismissed those signs. So you've got a headache for some times, but you kind of played it down or you think your kid had some issues and you kind of um, attributed it to something else. So there's some guilt there. Uh, there's also some dis dissatisfaction because if you've brought up those signs to your health professional and stage one, uh, and we're kind of dismissed, uh, then you, you may feel like 
not able to trust that person anymore. And that's something I see a lot in the old developmental um, field where a kid has a language delay uh, and basically they're told, oh, he's just a late talker. And at the end, like it reaches a point where everyone agrees, but so often the physician, uh, sorry, the patient or the families won't be like super comfortable following with that same uh, family doctor pediatrician. Then brings in also the issue of you're looking for information as a family and you're facing misinformation. And so we're kind of, I think, sometimes easy to judge families doing Google searches. Uh, some some doctors will say, oh, you ask Dr. Google. But on the flip side, I was talking to a physician who reminded me that we use Google all the time as physician too. And we, we look at information. We have some ways of some backgrounds to assert if the information is from trusted source or not, so on, but we do the same. So I don't think we should be judgmental in terms of that, but we should understand there's the issue of misinformation that can be there, especially when there is uh, you know, not a clear pathway of treatment uh, or if there's no proven treatment. So there's a lot of unproven treatment, which could be good or bad, um, you know, depending on the situation. Then there's the issue of accessibility for health professionals. So people based on the time where they live, uh, they may not have access to the health professional. So they may not be able to kind of validate those concepts with them. And then the policy kind of guides about screening. You may need to be over this age to have this screening. Uh, you know, having a gene, uh, positive gene family history may not always qualify you for having the testing yourself if you're not quote unquote symptomatic. And sometimes the definition for symptomatic is not what you would think as a definition for symptomatic. So that's something that is kind of more at the system level, but is a big issue, I think, in, in, in testing family. So um, uh, this was kind of something we were aware of for years because in the clinic, I keep on uh, repeating the same story and being surprised sometimes that people have not been tested for some tests, you know, that... Um, and then I realized it was not that straightforward. It was not always the doctor's fault. It was not the family's fault. It was kind of a combined uh, issue. I did see a major improvement with the event of people using Google and searching online. Uh, I did not see myself like a lot of families, uh, you know, having a lot of, um, uh, you know, pursuing false treatment or, you know, fake treatment and so on and so forth in my practice. But I, I'm aware this is something that can happen. Uh, I don't see everyone on the screen here. So if you have a question, maybe just use the raise the hand function. I think then you'll come up on my screen here. So the next step after you've kind of realized there's something, you're looking for a diagnosis probably or looking for information about it uh, is, is kind of bringing it up to your family doctor or your pediatrician or depending on your age, like the, the people that are following you. And, and then often it leads to a referral. Uh, at least in our field, where a family physician won't feel necessarily comfortable knowing what to do. And, and that's a big issue I want to discuss maybe later is how people feel about that. Um, should family doctors do more? Can they do more? And if we want them to do more, how do we think is the best way, best approach to do that? Because I think there's some ways we could improve what, what can be done in, in frontline. But there are some big challenges, especially in the field of rare disorders, where a physician probably won't have learned about this in school, won't have seen a patient with it, and won't, won't feel comfortable necessarily ordering tests, you know, that they don't know how to interpret or don't know how to provide counseling for. So this 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 referral, though I'm quite aware from my own practice, leads to long wait time. And so depending on where you live, there is sometimes, I was at the Kids Brain Health Network conference this week, um, and, and, you know, some families said by the time we got to see the specialist, the kid had outgrown the program. And so the kid could not be seen in that program anymore. So it was so bad that, you know, there's so many kind of filters and, and firewalls that it's hard for families to even get in sometimes in our field. I think in some cases, though, the long wait time can mean progression of disease and unnecessary tests or unnecessary treatment or exposure to treatment with side effects that may not result in an improvement. And I've certainly seen that in my field where people get an MRI because it's easy to get an MRI, but we all know that MRI is probably going to be normal, but the doctors or the, or the family is worried about getting genetic testing. And so we're doing things kind of to, to keep busy in some, in, in some ways, not really, but you know, in a way 
I would say. Uh, and so that that's a, that's an issue. At the health professional level, what was reported is the issue of lack of communication, siloed care. I think that's kind of the same idea. Um, and, and that's something that is a big issue if you get in the complex care world where there's a lot of specialists involved uh, or if you're dealing with a rare condition where there is a specialist that is on using it, one electronic medical record and the family physician does not use the same electronic medical record. So it makes it hard for them to communicate. I would say the flip side is when using an electronic medical record, it's easy to send a secure chat message to another specialist and quickly before a visit, coordinate what we're going to talk about, what's pending, what what do we think is the best best next approach based on, you know, for instance, my feedback to another specialist that's involved with the patient. And I've seen families really uh, appreciate that and I think it does enhance care. Um, the policies that I've seen issues, uh, you know, was the issue of like, again, the screening guidelines being limited to later signs. So, you know, you need to have a full blown picture before you can actually get the screening or the genetic testing. So that's something we, we, we want to talk about. And then finally, when you get to the point of having a diagnosis, um, the issue of you've got this huge learning curve about, you know, this diagnosis. Uh, you never knew about this before. You're, you didn't train on that. Your family doctor may never have trained about it, may never have seen it either. And then you've got this very steep literacy or learning curve that you have to go through. So you have either too much or too little information. You do your own search. You don't know what to believe or not. So there's the issue of access, but trust and overload of information. And lack of ways sometimes to go and validate some questions or validate some ideas with the health professional. So um, I think I think those are the main kind of issues that you know, if I looked at the documentation on, on the path to diagnosis for other disorders I've seen, and in blue, what I did is I put things that I think could be addressed or help with the eye or ways to improve communication, uh, exchange of information, sorry. Um, so question I had for you maybe is, what are the barriers that you experienced? This is from, again, like I said, my experience plus what, what, uh, what I've seen through court. But, you know, I don't know if anybody feels... Um, um, like talking, but you know, what are the type of barriers? Like, is there some in there that you've seen more than others? Is there other barriers that are not on there? And then what do people think? Again, uh, really impressed and mesmerized to see so many people here this morning. Uh, but what do you think AI could help with uh, in, in that pathway, um, in, the, in that kind of journey? Um, if you've found positive or uh, things that were helpful for you. So I'm just going to open up quickly for the floor and then come back for some more slides after that. And just unmute yourself and, and go ahead because I, I don't have a, um, I don't have, I don't see the, the entire screen. And I don't know if somebody can see the chat that cannot in my mode here of presentation. Yeah, I can help. I can help you a little bit there. You, I've Dan. seen that there are a couple of people here that have kind of put into both the chat and, um, you know, Andrew says, Xylex says the lack of biomarkers. If the diagnosis is, you know, one of elimination. So being able to, I'll read the number of them. Maybe you can respond to them. But I also invite people who are putting information in here. If you would like to kind of raise your hand and if you would like to speak with a bit more of an example around it. Adolin says, wait times, a lack of a structured referral process, lost to transition from pets to adult. So if you've got a disease that's not necessarily one that is well recognized or, you know, maybe diagnosed a little bit later in life, I think that's an issue. Trina says, I think AI could help speed up the process. For example, noticing a cluster of sheer symptoms right. um, for a much for action much more quickly. I think those are some of the comments. I don't know if you want to respond to those or whether or not any one of the people that kind of put in a message in there would like to expand on, on their uh, comment. So I can respond, but is there anybody that would like to give uh, more details on the, if you want to go jump, jump in. Duran, it's Andy here. Sorry, just, I mean, in, in, uh, working in ALS, obviously that's where my comment comes from. Um, 
where the, it's a in some cases as an ALS, it's a diagnosis of elimination. So there's not one of no no test genetic tests for the most part are not are not applicable, nor are blood tests or biomarkers not available. So it's really uh, you have to get the patient to the uh, clinical expert who knows how to diagnose uh, through um, physical examination that poses a problem. And I think that's probably the case in other similar types of uh, neurological conditions. Yeah, it's a good point. You know, and one of the things I've been discussing with 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 people in the field of AI and the people in the field of medicine, we also have interaction with people in the cardiology field for this project. You know, you're exactly right. I think that is not always um, a test or somebody talked about biomarkers that will basically nail the diagnosis. Uh, and that adds to the journey and adds to the wait time, the referral, and because each of these elimination takes some time is done sometimes by different people um so that goes to one thing that we've been talking about with Duran and actually Duran talked to me about uh, is the idea of clinical care pathway or care pathway which i've been uh reading like uh fanatic since uh, last week about and i have to say this is this was new to me in a way um and i think this is exactly what you're talking about two things clarifying the steps, the structure of the process. So, you know, uh, taking off and landing a plane is not something you just like figure out on the spot every time there's a procedure. And I think one thing that we agreed with, like talking with geneticists uh, that specialize uh, in neurogenetics and talking with family doctors actually, is that procedure, procedure, procedure. That's the only way to go for it. Trying to educate people on every single of the 10,000 rare disorder is not possible. It just is not something that's frequent enough for them to be able to spend the time and, and be able to go in depth enough. And what Genetis has told me is the issue is that if we then open up like genetic testing to everyone, then there's a lot of patients getting genetic testing that won't need it or won't benefit from it, I guess you could say. Um, uh, and that's the example, like you mentioned, where the diagnosis is not a genetic test, right? And there's a lot of rare disorders where the diagnosis is not, uh, so I don't think we should see this in a funnel, like just everything is genetic. We'll just get you like a way to swab you as quick as possible, send it to the lab, and then we'll, we'll, everything will be nice. It's not that simple, but what we're thinking about is, is kind of using AI to build these pathway and basically extract, like you said, the key, somebody mentioned cluster of symptoms. You know, what are the things, and I think that's how most family doctors would operate. If you see this, then you should raise an alarm and not just send a referral in for that person. Uh, if you see that, then you should. Now you deal with, then you have the issue of like pre-recognition versus detection. So you did you, do you end up, you know, waiting too long sometimes? Poss possibly, but I think it would be still more efficient than trying to teach, you know, every single rare disorder to the family doctor. So all these points like structured, clusters, I think, uh, in biomarkers or genetic testing, it kind of, to me, go together with this idea. Now, how do we do that? What I'm thinking we could do is try to use AI to summarize the information and bring it in one place and in a more accessible way. I see a patient with a rare disease. I go and spend two hours, three hours reading on it. I don't have time if I'm a family doctor to do that, right? So I'll end up referring to a specialist, which we assume will do that. But then the issue is that if I could see the specialist tomorrow, no problem. But the issue is that you wait to see the specialist. There's not going to be more specialists next year, uh, not more genetic counselors. So you end up with the issue of that you you just move the bottleneck somewhere else, I think. And, and that's kind of... Uh, what what your, your exactly your point is about, but you could flag that if you see these symptoms, then an MRI or consultation, urgent consultation to neurologist, so on and so forth, or nerve conduction or whatever. Like you know, depending on the condition, we could do that. So, yeah, no, that's a very good point. Thank you. Oh, I think what's um you know was raised in there as well, and you can come back to it. There's a couple of hands up, so we want to give people a chance. But you know, one of the things we heard recently, of course, is using AI to actually do the machine learning, right? So if we've got enough data from across enough patients, so think about ALS, as you say, yeah. if you could build a gigantic database that actually then begins to systematically organize the kinds of symptoms that patients with ALS experience and the ones then that have led to a diagnosis, then it's possible, as you say, once you've got an individual, whether it's a patient or a healthcare professional who could go into this structured yeah. database, 
put in those symptoms and then be able to extract, you know, a possible diagnosis. But it's building that giant database to start with, which is why I think the real quest is how can we get more patients to actually be willing to have their information to go into these databases. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. This is this is really important. The, the, the positive thing, though, I would say is that there is already some data from hospital and clinics that can be used. And I think the appetite for that and the openness to that has increased a lot since there is better ways of reading charts than there was five years or even three years ago. It used to be, a, you know, a PhD thesis to kind of try to understand how an elderly would talk about a memory problem. And now you can get that, you know, pretty easily with, with the new language model. So I think there's, you know, it's just like, Getting a better computer, getting a computer that now can execute this operation where it was just not possible before it would take so long. So I think, but I agree with you. We want to complement that because there's some things that are captured in data like that that will never be captured. Uh, that would be only captured though from from family story or patient stories they call it. And I think we really want to have that aspect too because then we'll get a completely also uh, different and, and complementary phase uh, about positive approaches. Uh, you know, other interventions. So, yeah. Murph has his hand up. Murph, do you want to jump in? Hi, good morning. morning. My viewpoint or my vision is perhaps a little simplistic, but what I envision is a AI enabled database, similar to what other people were saying, whereby you know, typically a patient would see five, six, seven different doctor specialists and with different symptoms. Now, if there was a mechanism for AI to actually compare those symptoms, to gather that data and say, if this, this, and this, then raise the yeah. red flag. It could be one of these things, perhaps. Yeah. But, so that is that is perhaps it's not. Uh, I mean, I share your simplistic, uh, quote-unquote, uh, view of things. Um and I think this is kind of the way to go is think about a guide to 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 to, to the physician. So when I'm going to say, you know, this is 100% certain this thing. And, you know, in medicine, we never practice like that. We always think about differential diagnosis. So we have like, you know, this is the most likely, this is the less likely, and this is the very dangerous thing that we cannot miss. And, you know, that's how we're trained and that's how we train our students because there is, you know, it's likely you could just got a cold, but this could be more serious. And here's the thing we would do for that. And I think that the default to it's just a cold is something that I see a lot, you know, in cases that are missed or delayed or stuff like that, is that there has been this lack of awareness about the quote unquote dangerous or more severe kind of um, conditions. So yeah, your idea of forming clusters of like things, because we don't want to, if we flag everything as being, I don't know if you guys uh, experienced that, but there was these call centers about 20 years ago, like where you'd call and, you know, it was always go to emergency room. And so we had this problem where everyone came to emergency room, which is kind of totally fine from a legal standpoint for the, for the, for the call place. But, you know, it's just like, I still remember like asking a mom, why do you, why are you here? And she's like, oh, I called and they said to come here. It's like, are you worried about it? She's like, no, I'm not worried, but now I am since they told me to come here. And so people will just flood the immersion and there's been a lot of fine tuning. So that kind of speaks to what you're talking about. I think is that, so just so you know, I don't know if anybody has used chat GPT to do that uh, because I've tried with a lot of condition. Actually, we just took a list of 10,000 rare disorders and we just tried it to see it is good at telling you what is syndrome X and giving you actually a pretty good definition of it. Like if you've got syndrome, whatever, or fragile X or this disease or that. But if you put the core symptoms of it and ask it, what do you think it is? Actually, in none of the cases we had, we had a lot of diagnosis, but none of them we get, we came to the original diagnosis that we had used to kind of put in there. So that speaks to what you're saying. I think that we'll need to refine and that's also because I think part of it is that the training that's done for the public model is not focused on rare disease. It's it's everything and anything on the internet. So it goes from making a drink to cooking, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, French Canadian food or something. So it is not specific to our field, but I think it has the potential to do that um, in benefit mm -hmm. like a lot of people. Yeah, Bill has a hand up, and then we've got yes. also a question that's in the chat that we want to raise. Bill, go ahead. 
Yes, actually, I'd, I'd like to follow up on that last point. Uh, rare diseases often have very heterogeneous uh, presentations, uh, even for the same disease. Uh, how, and AI really depends on pattern matching. Yeah. How do you train uh, uh, AI uh, models when you have such heterogeneous uh, input? Uh, somebody has to clean the material rather than just assume it can be scanned and put in. How do you see that working? So I had this very question to some, an expert from Toronto uh, yesterday, actually, and he said you, you need to fine tune the model, basically. And so if we're thinking about rare, but if you, if you're thinking about ultra rare, you're not going to have like 50,000 pages on the internet to train on, right? So, and as you mentioned, and I don't think that's specific actually that to necessarily to rare disease. And I think there's quote unquote other disorders where there's actually more variability than than you know than we thought. Um, and and so, yeah, I, I think the idea, we I don't have an answer for that. I think that's a research question we're putting in our project too to to see how we we do that. One of the way it can be done, and people have been doing it, is to have experts in the loop. Uh, so experts with lived experience, so families to say, look, this is not true that you always need to have like, you know, um, this, this issue. Uh, and, and the other issue is uh, the other way, sorry, is to assess the output again with, well, I guess it comes back to the expert in the loop. And so that's why I wanted to do this webinar, uh, you know, or to do a discussion was to see what would be the willingness of people from the different See, I see AI not as a top down, but I think to some degree it needs to be a bottom up to like, we will need to have good prediction or good recommendation. We need to have experts uh, that have knowledge of that and can evaluate that because there's not going to be a person that can evaluate the entire rare disorders, you know, uh, all of them. And so, and the doctors will have one view of the world and then the families will have another view of the world. Uh, the conference I was at this weekend, the family said, you've got textbook, we've got storybooks. And so I thought this was a great kind of catchphrase because it kind of talks about the different experiences here, like we view one. So the model needs to recognize that if it's going to be intended for what, quote unquote, end users that are professionals, but also uh, families and patients, right? So let so you touch me... On that. You touch on a very important point. I don't have an answer uh, about like how we're going to do it. I've got a couple of ideas of strategies, you know, but yeah. So let me interrupt you again, because we've got a couple of related questions that are coming through the chat here. One is obviously then it requires our having a rare disease registry. So patient information can be collected, but also sort of some of the challenges around one patient consent to have the registries used. Yeah. And also the notion is that obviously a Canadian registry for rare diseases is not terribly useful because we don't have enough patients. You know, we're not going to have enough experience put into it. I mean, we may have some, but to really build, as you say, a robust uh, uh, database that will allow it to come to an accurate diagnosis, I think is is challenging. And one here that says, I, I can't, if you don't mind, she wrote in there, she put her child's symptoms into the chat GBT, it came up mm -hmm. with angel months, which was one of the first things BCCH ruled out in 2006 before they identified the actual, you know, uh, mm -hmm. condition. So I think the challenge is having a big enough database, but also the importance of Canadian patients. You know, can we overcome the barrier of actually being able to have a Canadian database and then having that information be used and even uploaded into larger databases where they can actually both contribute and be, you know, kind of retrieved yeah, I mean, this is, I really like the example you gave. Uh, and I think that is part of the frustration that you experience clinically as a physician and also as a patient is that you go through like, what's the most common thing? What's the next one and next one? And we are feeling in our head, we're going by elimination, but people feel you're just fishing and taking a very long time. And so it's a very different view of things when you're on one side and the other. And if the child is not doing well, that's even worse. You know, if you think about it, like I've got some patients that have deteriorated in front of my eyes, uh, you know, while we were doing that elimination process. So this is uh, not fun for, I would say anybody, but completely different experience probably for, for, for each of us. Uh, I, I would say during that, you know, things, you, you always think of, I look sometimes at the big projects or the big international things, and then you realize they started with smaller 
like this was one thing from being a student going to being an older person is is realizing that big things start small and that they don't always start with grandiose kind of view of things they, they sometimes start very small but then if they are kind of um, properly networked which i think you guys are at the international level then the key champion kind of get together and then all of a sudden you go to a next level uh, you start from having something that's local uh, and you know i think stuff on the internet has that potential you start with these small things and then all of a sudden they are huge and you're like what happened and it's just this kind of you know yeah. multifocal kind of expansion all of a sudden so i don't know i i don't want to sound too uh uh utopic here but i think this is kind of having a canadian and then seeing there's an Australian and then there's this and that. I think this is the kind of, then everyone has it. And then all of a sudden, then you you can actually have that large data and, and do those things. The yeah, caution it's a matter of be, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a matter of being able to, as you say, to people talk about being able to combine or federate the data, you know, not the databases, but the data. I just came back from Beijing where they're talking about a huge ambitious project to actually search all of the Chinese databases, electronic health records to find, um, looking for um, Alzheimer's. And can we find patterns in, in, in terms of being able, starting with patients that are diagnosed with Alzheimer's, what are the patterns, the profiles there? And then as we say, going into the bigger database, identifying patients who match those profiles to then be able to validate, is this sufficient? And I mean, Obviously, as China says, we have enough patience that we can do that. But I think all of us being able to be part of that would be great. Um, Kate has her hand up, and then we'll come back to, um, I think a lot of people, you know, chime in and say, how do we get that robust data set? But Kate, I'll hand it over to you. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> thank you for this great webinar. Uh, maybe perhaps somebody already mentioned this, but um, further to my comment about what I know AI to be used for. Um, I, I just noticed that in your slides, you stop a diagnosis. Yeah. Um, and I wonder why, because I guess my understanding and also part of my mission, my son has early onset OTC deficiency, mm -hmm. is finding uh, a treatment for him that's better than what currently exists. Uh, specifically because I know for this condition, there's over 500 mutations oh. identified. And he has one of the uh, much rarer mutations um, and has more of an enzymatic um, activity, which I think should also lead to better treatment options than what we have, which is liver transplant or medication that doesn't work so well. Yeah, so I mentioned this at the beginning quickly, but mm, as a clinician... Sorry, can you hear mm -hmm. my, Oh, can you... No, I said, sorry, I didn't hear that part, maybe. So I apologize. No, no worries, you... but it's a good opportunity to tech on that. To me, all the stuff we learned from the pre-diagnosis will also serve in the post-diagnosis. Because, right. like, you know, anything you learn about the patterns, like Doreen is talking about, or the biomarkers, mm -hmm. uh, if, you have, if you have them, will give you cues as to what you should do in the treatment, as opposed to taking this into a mouse or a fly like I do, and just trying to build something from the ground up. Like, we right. need to look what people experience and then exactly reconstruct that or uh, retro uh reverse engineer that to like toward the treatment i think we're going to get much higher yield treatment that way than <laughs> to create it from scratch with a model um but the the reason i made that slide this way was because that i'll be very uh blunt this was for a project that we're putting together which explicitly says you know stop at diagnosis uh, and so that's why I, I stopped there. But I think you're completely right. And I think I've been debating with myself, should I still add the treatment piece? Because I, I think for me, that's the real, like I said at the beginning, the intervention is the goal. And it's not the diagnosis. I mean, the oh. diagnosis is important, but there's also some reason why I think the focus should be on the intervention. Uh, one of them being that there's so many diagnoses that have cross-diagnosis overlap that would benefit from a similar intervention. And so I think that, that, that anyway, yeah, thank you. I think I will add that section to my figure now because I feel bad about it. And I think you, you, you touch on why it's so important to, uh, to, to do that. Thank you. And just quickly to add as well, sorry, it's just um, for my, not our specific case, like my son didn't even go through this um, 
like Liz because he got so sick at day four of life and he was yeah. misdiagnosed and then quickly had to be diagnosed. Otherwise, he wouldn't have made it. But yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's, like, that's, a, that's an yes. important point. I think there is some situation where critic, like I think we have to distinguish between situation that are like quickly or rapidly progressive to situation where things are, you know, not, uh, as quickly progressive and and I think that's important to consider that when we're thinking about families to their readiness to uh, using AI using genetic testing and all that is different because of that too uh, yeah so there's the two halves of it as you said you know Francois the first is how do we build a robust database and this is what a lot of people are saying and we really do need to be you know get thinking globally in order to get to that point but also being able to input you know those conditions that are specific to Canada and we do know that's yeah. the case so building the robust database but then as you say then how do we actually use it and I would really encourage as we are hearing here, you know, it's not just to the diagnosis treatment because we can do the same thing, right? I mean, the goal at the end of the day is to be able to match the diagnosis with an optimal treatment pathway. And again, as I think others have mentioned, many of these conditions are multi, you know, kind of faceted. They have many different presentations and we don't know at this point kind of what works for what, but if we use and we're able to harness that, the same as we're talking about, if I go back to diagnosis, one of the things we heard that was truly exciting was the ability to now really marry a lot of the genetic and genomic, you know, uh, uh, diagnoses to actually phenotypes. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, right, most family physicians, pediatricians, but especially families, they don't have access to the genetic database, no. but they do have access to knowing what the symptoms are and how it looks. So if we can start at that end, and as you say, hopefully we get to the point where, you know, as Dolan, you know, as uh, some of the people here were saying, uh, Trina was saying that we do have a robust enough database. So as you were saying as well, when we put in the data, we don't come out with either the most common diagnosis or misdiagnosis. Um, exactly. But that really is, I think, I mean, I, I think the exciting thing is we were in a, a forum in Merv and Marie uh, were also in that same forum is that this area is going to grow very fast. Mm -hmm. You know, we're looking at where we are today and where we were five years ago. We're a world apart. So I think our jumping into it as Canada, especially now with a rare disease strategy in front of us, a drug strategy is the ideal time to try to make sure that we're part of that growing development, both in terms of the expertise as well. So I also really applaud your, your bringing this on, you know, Francois, because I think we need to make sure that Canada doesn't miss the boat on this in terms of the, the, the participation in this. Um, I'm going to stop for a second. Bill, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. I'd just like to follow up on, on your comment. Uh, a few years ago here at UBC, we had a, a, a symposium on rare diseases. And one of the issues that we came up against was uh, registries and the fact that most rare disease registries or, or most uh, sources of data in registries is that are actually owned by drug companies who are doing clinical mm -hmm. trials. And one of the things that uh, uh, we proposed as, as a Canadian strategy was to develop a health system-based registry that could be licensed to yeah. uh, drug companies rather than having drug, drug companies holding the, the data. And that would also benefit, probably make it more, make patients more willing to contribute if they knew that this was uh, donating to the common good rather than individual studies that may or may not uh, produce results. Can I respond to you quickly for a second, Bill? And I'm hoping, I don't know if you've signed up to come to our conference in Calgary. If not, I hope you do. And I hope that, you know, you can reach out to us. One of the things we will be presenting and proposing is actually have a Canadian rare disease data platform. I call it more than a registry because it's beyond that. But the idea, as you say, is to provide opportunities. I mean, many diseases themselves have their own registries, but many that are smaller or diseases that are more rare, we you know, we need to provide the opportunity for them to also be able to start inputting their data. But there's all the issues around safety, security, and transportability, et cetera. So we're really hoping that you know we can get a lot of people that are interested to help us in terms of moving this forward. But we think certainly CORD 
you know, has an opportunity working with the clinicians and the clinical teams and the researchers to actually start to put this in place. So I'm really putting this out as an open invitation to people who are interested to come and join us. We're going to be presenting one model of a, a patient platform. And, um, you know, there may be others there, but we need to, as you say, start to move in that direction where we can make sure that we're providing opportunities for clin uh, uh, patient data to be collected from Canada. And as Bill and others really know, having also a registry where we can offer, you know, the right patients to clinical trials is a huge way of attracting clinical trials. So if you can say, I've already got those patients, you know, or I can find those patients for you, it's a way of bringing that in. So hugely uh, important in terms of what you and said. And as, as a clinician and an investigator on clinical trial myself, I think it would make our life also much easier than having Zoom calls with families every week or uh, at night, you know, and trying to get families aware of our trials, you know. But I think it's really important to build in an option there, like families that want to be receiving information but are not on board with some other things. So I think, uh, you know, like Doreen was saying, like at a, uh, you know, a coming conference, but that's something we've been talking a lot. I think it's building this option also of, you want to consent to this, this, but not that, right? And and so because different families have different uh, conditions that they're dealing with with different like urgencies, and I think that's really also something I've seen in my practice both at the genetic testing level at the being part of a um, database. But yeah, I think that's super important for for no knowing about condition, attracting treatment, and so on. I was just going to ask, I think we are running low on time. And this is, uh, <laughs> this is, you guys made my day today. Thank you so much um, by coming everyone here. Like this is beyond my uh, wildest dream, as they say. But um, I was just going to ask, like, I don't know how to do this here, but like how many of you guys are using chat GPT? I just want to know because I'm talking with some families and <laughs> many, many of them, like, I am a late adopter to technology. I have to say myself. Uh, I work on it now, but I, I mostly don't use these things very much. Uh, so is that the majority of people or, or like, and I want to hear like, is there people that are critics or have big time issues with some of that? Because that's important for our project also. And, and this is kind of also a plug I'm going to say now, if in case people have to leave, uh, you know, we're building a project with Rain on the on the using AI to accelerate diagnosis and make it more accurate. And really it's a multifaceted project really. And this is a grant that we're submitting to CIHR. Uh, so, you know, I really want to have in there, I think we need to have the feedback from families as we go forward with this. This is not like, oh, we just need to have families on board. But like what you guys said this morning, kind of some of it resonate with what we've been thinking. Some of it is actually more provocative than what I was thinking, uh, which is really cool. Uh, but yeah, is this like a, a technology a lot of people know about or some people know but never use it? So it's hard to do this with the slide up. Maybe I can close the slide. Yeah, you can close the slide, but we can also do a quick survey out to all the registrants and get some feedback as well. So if that oh, would I be see. useful to people. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a little hard, as you say, to do this kind yeah, of there's too many people. survey. There's anyway, too many people here. But I, I think you've gotten some good comments here. There are people who say, yes, I use it. Jan says, I use it very definitively. Um, <laughs> there's some comment that says, use it, but, you know, uh, we need to do it with some caution because there's yeah. also, you know, many challenges. Um, and I think beyond that, there's also, you know, uh, the notion is that, yes, we, we've used it, but not necessarily in a medical context. So I yeah. think there are people familiar with it, but I think... Um, I think this is going to be something that hopefully is going to be much more, you know, kind of in people's kind of knowledge scope as we moving forward. Um, as we say, we think right now things are good, but, you know, two years from now, this will seem like the dumbest conversation going because we will yes. have exceeded all yeah. of this so far. Jan, yes, can jump in there. You, you ask how we use, I, I already challenged chat G GPT with strange subject will merge some subject like healthy and virtual realities. Yeah. And at the end, I am, the, the answer they provide to me, it's almost the word I inside of chat GPT. So I think I'm the first to 
start to ask question about that kind You're of creating subject. content <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> Yeah, we've tested a couple of issues. Somebody wrote like a proofread it or a QC a quality control, I guess it. Um, there's the issue. I don't know if you're aware of like hallucination, they call it, or confabulation, which is the new term. So chat GPT will make up stuff, will even create references or say about uh law cases that are completely made up and will create people as sources that don't exist. And so I think this is something that we're aware, that's one of the issues. There's also some bias in terms of the the topic and who you ask, like if you're asking about male, female, LGBTQ, if you're asking about, you know, if you ask a question. Uh, yeah. Relation and power and balance between researcher yeah. and the patient. They also yeah. have BS in chat GPT about that. Yeah. If you ask a yeah. question as a doctor and you say you identify yourself as a doctor and you ask a, a, a question as I'm a mother of, uh, we're, we're working on putting together some some kind of a, pa a paper on that. It is actually quite divergent, the response you'll get uh, in, 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 yeah, in a, in a big way. So, yeah. Oh, uh, I'll jump in for a second. There's a question, there's a question here. And I'm not sure if you can respond to it. Calvin writes, any plan to integrate information from Alpha Missense catalog? And I will get put a little caveat in there. I just went to chat GPT. And I even have the research version of it and asked them to tell me what the Alpha Sense catalog is. And they say, we don't have any information on that. So uh, chat GPT is not quite as up to date as some of our participants here. But um, can you I, respond I was to say, I don't not know. I don't know what that is. So if you can send me Calvin, that can you maybe you can just give us a quick second and what is AlphaSense? Uh the Alpha Missense dot catalog. I don't know if I, Calvin I wrote it down and I will look it up. Uh yeah. you touch on one point though. You said I, I even have the paid version. So I don't know if your people are aware, but there is like the chat GPT, which is a free version, and there's also the version uh, that we actually we use both in the lab for comparative because uh, the 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 private or the paid version is called GPT-4 and has more information in it and has more I would say nuanced kind of answers but also has taken some trends in responding to questions about for instance misinformation because we talked about this as one of the barriers uh, oh thank you I will look it up uh, there's there's actually uh, quite a surprising trend sometime in, in being very self-confident about the answers. And uh, like Jan said, like people contributing things that then become kind of, because they're in a gap, uh, become the answer, right? And so, because this is a probabilistic model. So basically it tells you just like, what is the next word that's most likely to come next to the next word on the internet? So if you have something that's overrepresented, it will say that this is, you know, very likely to be associated. So there's a lot of filter or cleanup. Somebody I think said that between the kind of the pre-public models and the public models apparently going on and and trying to validate uh, or find these issues uh, that are biased basically. So that's something we're also kind of, somebody mentioned that rare disease are rare. There's not going to be a lot of internet on it, but there's also the issue that if something mis misinformation gets on it, and it has only a five publication, that one becomes kind of a fifth of the information. So that's something also we need to be super careful with. Uh, that's something I've seen yeah. a lot of my families coming like, okay, I'm going for stem cell therapy. And I'm like, there's no stem cell therapy for your condition. There is stem cell therapy for other conditions, but it's hard to know this when you don't know the field necessarily, right? So there's, there's, there's a big implication, I would say at some point. We're all, almost out of time, and I don't yeah, want to have boy, people just we needed more time. <laughs> we need a lot, but you know what? I want to make the invite to people. You know, do join us. Uh, we will have a conference in Calgary, and not everybody's going to be able to come to our court conference in Calgary. We happen twice a year, once in um, uh, the November 29th and 30th. We will be in Calgary, and we will have uh, Dr. Bodolf, who's going to be speaking again there, and I think he's going to probably use all the information you got from this webinar to actually present there. So I, that's okay. I, which, if that's which okay, is a great opportunity, whatever. right? Yeah, great opportunity. But we do want to make this a very much, I think, an area that we can work on together. 
So, not, not, you know, in, in addition to, I think, what you want to do in research, right, we would love to hear from everybody here. You know, how can we work together? How can we, you know, do this better? As I say, we're going to try to introduce a patient data platform or patient registry, but we really want to be able to continue the dialogue in terms of using not just artificial intelligence, but how do we actually advance, advance in terms of being able to the ultimate goal, getting more accurate diagnosis, and also being able to make sure that we're tied up to the optimal treatment. We are gonna have a discussion at the conference on optimized patient care pathways, which I think is the second part of, as you're saying, getting to a diagnosis, the question then becomes, what's the optimal way of treating this? And some of this will come from you know, what we already know, but I can see in the future, that can also be subject to the AI that we're talking about in terms of getting to a diagnosis. So I think we're all entering into a brave new field that um, is going to have a whole lot of misinformation and missteps in it, but at the end of the day, it's going to give us back a whole lot. So uh, I just would like to uh, maybe give you a chance, Francois, to just uh, maybe wrap up and then we'll uh, you know, kind of talk about uh, maybe the opportunity to have some future webinars. You know, I think my wrap up is going to be thank you, everyone, uh, for like I'm touched actually. I didn't expect that. Maybe Dorin uh, did, but I I didn't expect so many people and the the conversation, uh, the comments and people putting stuff in the chat. Uh, yeah, this is beyond me. Um, thank you. And this is uh, like as we say, hopefully, uh, just the beginning. I think that. There's a lot of potential. There's a lot of issues we need to think about. We need to be involved, not to be just, I think we need part of the driving of this, not just be passenger and users. I think we could be part of the development. Canada is strong in AI, strong in rare disease. And I think we've got families and professionals working together. So I, I think all the ingredients are there uh, to make use of that actually to our benefit. And they, improve things like Doreen said there was a time where we would talk oh do you have a cell phone and now <laughs> this is kind of a you know kind of, or like somebody told me a telephone that takes pictures uh <laughs> you know we would not think about that now so it's kind of nice so yeah thanks everyone Thank you to everyone. And uh, the webinar itself will be archived, so it will be available to look at. And hopefully many of these comments that are in this chat, I'm not sure how it works. Hopefully it can be captured as well. Yeah. We got some good references to the papers, et cetera. So we'll try to make sure that they're attached as part of the information. Many thanks, Francois, for taking the opportunity, taking the time to do this, and for really keeping it such a lively, interactive discussion. I had great fears when I saw the numbers coming on that this was going to be something that was not at all going to be interactive, but I'm thrilled that people were really jumped in and provided a lot of information. So we're going to be able to move forward. Great reference here from, I just want, don't want to miss it, Michelle Long, about the Canadian Hemophilia you know, Registry, which is the longest standing registry we have, and certainly some of the great work that's coming out of it. Uh, Calvin did uh, provide the link to his paper, yeah. so we'll make sure we have that available to everybody. Thank you. And also, as you say, the registry for patients in Quebec is um, as part of the Quebec Archimo. So thanks to everybody, and we'll look forward to see you. And if you are interested in the uh, uh, conference in Calgary, you know, uh, check on our website, and uh, you know, and if you're part of our membership base, we will try to see if we can get you there. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.